I'm delighted to have the pleasure to introduce to you all Jeff Mulgan. Uh, his bio is in the pack, so I won't dwell in detail on that. Suffice it to say that one of the questions that I think has run through our conversation today has been, on the one hand, how people make the transition from preparing for government, from campaigning, for building social movements and electioneering into actually implementing and delivering policy. And on the other hand, we've been thinking quite a lot about how social movements and other actors can play a really active and engaged role in the implementation and delivery of government. Jeff's CV speaks for itself, his experience in both of these uh, challenges that we've been discussing, and I, for one, am very much looking forward to what he's got to say to us. Jeff Morgan. OK, this is, this is working. I was told to speak a bit about expectations, and I realise your main expectation at the moment is a drink in a bit over a half an hour's time. So I'm going to try and keep my remarks relatively um, contained. And I thought I'd start with two, two vignettes, both from India. The first comes from about a year ago, when um, uh, there was a huge anti-corruption uh, movement in India, led by Anna Hazari. You may remember seeing the crowds on the streets of Delhi. And that group stumbled across a remarkable campaigning method, which was to persuade people to make a phone call to a number, but then to ring off before it was answered. And it was called the missed call uh, campaigning tool. 35 million people used this method to register support for the anti-corruption campaign, which I think is claimed to be the biggest mobilization on one issue by one group of people ever in human history. A brilliant idea which has since spread to other countries, but almost a metaphor of what can go wrong in the relationship between citizens and the state when you express yourself through a non-communication with the state. And it's brilliant in a way because you get the SMS details to send messages back. So that, that's one vignette. The other also comes from India, where I was a couple of weeks ago visiting Pratap, uh, an organisation some of you may know, which is an NGO involved in education. They've now reached over 30 million young people, helping them with reading, using essentially a volunteer workforce and volunteers training other volunteers to improve educational outcomes. A very Indian organisation in many ways, but also one with parallels here. If you go to the primary or secondary schools around here, or indeed if you go to the hospital, you'll find there are paid professionals, teaching, curing, and so on, but you'll also find those public services have always depended massively on volunteer labor. It's usually been estimated about a half a million volunteers in the health service in this country, about the same number in education. And the picture of a sort of top-down monolithic public service has never been true. So these are two pictures of sort of people power, one angry, hot, frustrated, the other in a way routine, every day, fairly calm. And they're both sort of realities of what I think we're talking about here, people power and politics. And they both point us, I think, to what I assume sort of lies behind today's discussion, which is um, how we refine the Gettysburg Address. Now, all of you will remember the Gettysburg Address, probably word for word, which I don't. But uh, Lincoln uh, talked of democracy as government, I can never remember which order it is, of the people, by the people, for the people. But in a way, we're also now talking about a fourth preposition, with the people. What does it mean to govern with the people and not just to have 35 million missed calls? And how do we get beyond the polarisation, which you see in almost every country now, where when we wear our hats as citizens, we feel like the journalists who were told by their editor, whenever you're talking to a politician, ask yourself, why is this lying bastard lying to me? Which I think is how many people feel. And on the other hand, how governments feel, and many of you are from governments, and inside, in private, governments do often feel like uh, the East German government in the famous poem by Bertolt Brecht, about the workers' uprising when he says perhaps it's time for the government to dissolve the people and elect another. <laughs> <laughs> they don't say that in public, but that's how they feel. So I, I was asked to say a bit about expectations, because I think everywhere, and including I've heard it today, there is a standard story about what's happening to government around the world, which says public expectations are rising, 
all the time, remorselessly, and there's no way for government to keep up, no way for you to keep up. Therefore, we are condemned to perpetual disappointment, failure, and frustration. How many people roughly in this room buy that sort of story of what is happening in the world? A handful, actually not very many of you, Well, maybe we'll come back to that in a minute. I think it's a, say it's a very common story. I'm not totally certain it's true. It's true that our expectations of many things, like of um, you know, air travel or computers, are rising. Um, but according to the main pollster in this country, Ipsos Mori, one of them, there's actually no quantitative evidence at all that expectations have risen over time. In the US, it seems this is a generation who expects their children to be poorer than they were, which again slightly fights against that, that rising expectations um, argument. And I think, although it's fair to assume we do expect many things to improve, it's not at all obvious that the public are so naive or so unrealistic that they have absurd expectations of government and are in this state of perpetual disappointment. It's also, I think, worth asking whether high expectations are good or bad. What do you think? A public with very high expectations, is that a good thing for a society? Or is it a bad thing for a society? Last week's PISA report was really interesting on this. The top performers in PISA, uh, Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, one of the features of their performance was they set very high expectations of every pupil. And high expectations drove achievement. By contrast, perhaps places with low expectations don't achieve. Slightly unfortunate that the day after the PISA report, the Mayor of London gave a speech which he said that a large minority of the British population were condemned by genetics to be stupid forever. <coughs> it's bad timing there. But also potentially a rather dangerous thing for political leaders to do to lower expectations. The contrary view, however, says that happiness comes from having your expectations in line with reality. Some of you may know the research on happiness through the life cycle, which roughly shows that on average it declines, reaches a bottom and then goes up again. Uh, do you know what the lowest point on the happiness U-curve is? It's about age 41. So if any of you are 41, the only way is up. You will be ever happier as you grow into <laughs> uh, old age. And those of you who are younger, I'm afraid, yeah, it can only get worse. Uh, and according to that view, the key is to get expectations in line with reality. So if you're a government, do whatever you can to dampen to expectations. Don't make wild promises. Don't expect to tell every child they can be sort of Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. And in that view, you know, maybe the best approach is to be like a Berlusconi who could never disappoint his citizens on ethics. <laughs> Whereas the opposite, you know, democratic South Africa perhaps was always bound to disappoint because the expectations were so high. Now, again, there's a grain of truth in that, but I think it's quite a, 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 a dangerous point of view. And I want to suggest a different answer to the standard trope in which there are rising expectations which governments can never keep up with. So let me ask you another question. What are your expectations of your parents, your children? your closest friends? Do they disappoint you constantly? Do you rank them once a day, you know, out of 10, how they're doing on expectations? My guess is you find that question an absurd question. And that it's absurd, I think, tells us something very important about politics. You only talk the language of expectations where you don't have a relationship, where you have a serious relationship in a way you share a project, you share its outcomes, you belong together to something which is bigger than both of you. And I think that part of the key to understanding the way out of the expectations trap is to think about government in relational terms. And much of what's been happening here today essentially is about thinking about government in relational terms. I've become increasingly interested in this through three, three reasons. One is perhaps an obvious one, it's seeing what's happened to the new public management theories of government, which became very fashionable in the 80s and 90s, which were all about marketization and targets, separating policy from delivery. You'll all be very familiar with those methods, and 
I worked in a government which implemented quite a lot of them fairly ferociously. We had a thousand targets at one point. The very striking experience around the world was that although those methods did some good in making governments more efficient, they were remarkably ineffective at making the public like governments or re-elect governments who feel warm about the targets imposed on them for some of the reasons, in fact, described uh, earlier today. Many targets were, mid were, were, were reached, but they kind of missed the point in the famous uh, saying. Now, those ideas are still spreading around the world, including, I think, most of the big consultancies are still essentially peddling new public management ideas. But within governments, the discussion has moved on to how can we not only achieve our outcomes, our outputs, be efficient, etc., but how can we also cultivate a really strong relationship with our citizens, a relationship of trust, reciprocity, and so on. The other factor which has struck me is what's happening in business. For the last 20 years, business has increasingly talked about relationships and the value which lies in relationships. That's why they spend so much on CRM and other tools to get feedback, to involve users in shaping products, to target more accurately. If you look at which sectors of the economy are going to be the biggest ones in 10 or 20 years' time, they are ones like health, like care, like education, which involve some sale of commodities, of products, drugs, stuff, but a large part of the value they create is relational the value of a doctor to a patient, a teacher to a pupil. One reason why the bottom has already fallen out of the MOOCs market is it disregarded decades of evidence about technology and education, which emphasizes this relational um, point. And of course, the third reason for taking this stuff seriously is technology. We live surrounded by social media technologies, which have created vast value for their companies, but that value lies in the value of the relationships between people, the people who create the value of Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and so on. And I think there's really important sort of lessons there for how we think about government and how we think about people-powered government. Now, if you ask, if, if governments come to the conclusion, okay, relationships matter as well as outputs and outcomes, which I think is fairly standard now, it follows you've got to be clear what kind of relationships you want. And they turn out to be quite variable. So some relationships you probably want with government are almost minimal. When you're paying taxes, you probably would like to be an Australian. In Australia, you can link the tax authorities with your bank account and simply sort of press a button to accept their calculation of your tax obligations, thus saving you many, many evenings to have fun, which sadly we don't get in this country. Licenses, all sorts of other things you want simple and frictionless. And there is still, I think, huge momentum towards automating government to make it more effective. India, again, is probably the most interesting example now, with the Universal ID project led by Nanda Nilekani, has reached about 500 million people on track to a billion people with a biometric ID as a platform on which you can run some public services, some welfare, some banking thus bypassing the coercive, exploitative relationships of local power, which otherwise siphons off money before it reaches people. And there are many, many other examples of automation still being uh, valuable. But I want to focus on the sort of things we've been talking about today, which I think are, are, are the other ones, where a change of relationship actually helps both state and citizen achieve their goals. And I'll do 30 seconds each on five or six different examples. Let's start with open data, which has been mentioned a lot. Uh, I seem to spend a lot of my life on open data at the moment. I'm generally an enthusiast for the extraordinary things which are possible. I don't know how many of you joined the Open Government Partnership in London a few weeks ago. Over a thousand people from 80 countries, I think, were there, all sharing experiences. Lots happening in transport, lots in other fields. And yet, the really striking thing about that gathering is something no one's mentioned today. Most of the open data apps and tools coming out aren't really working. They're not really being taken up by the public for a very, very simple reason. They've been developed by either the bureaucrats or the technocrats or the geeks who didn't actually bother asking anyone what they actually wanted 
what would actually be helpful to them in their own lives. And interestingly, when you do ask that question, you get some quite problematic answers. So one example of many is South Chicago, very poor area of that city. Guess what people most want from open data in South Chicago? What would you guess? They want real-time crime data. They want to know a murder has been committed on that street, so I shouldn't walk there. <laughs> How do the police feel about that? Not very good, so it's not going to happen. And uh, there's a whole series of examples of that kind where actually open data, which has started off as a slightly simplistic, rather top-down movement, is in fact unlocking a different kind of conversation with the people, the public, about what data um, they want. Another example of this is, is evidence. And I spent some of my, my morning today with these, the British evidence community. We've, we've gone through a rather strange process in the last year or two of creating a whole infrastructure around evidence, which I would never have guessed could happen. My organisation hosts something called the Alliance for Useful Evidence. It has 1,500 organisations in it committed to creating and using evidence in health, education, policing and so on better. And we argued that the government should set up what works centres to be independent brokers of what works in all these fields. And to our astonishment, the government agreed. And there are now six of these open. Now, these are in a way speaking truth to power. They will often tell government, your very favoured policy isn't actually working, unfortunately. Uh, and there's quite a few of those. But in another respect, they, these are services to both state and citizen to help them get more value for money, to help get better effects. And one of the ministers in launching these What Work Centres a few months ago in, in our building quoted Mark Twain. It's a wonderful quote from Mark Twain, where he says, if in doubt, tell the truth, it will astound your friends and confound your enemies. And in a way, that's what government is doing. Maybe if you're just honest about this stuff, it doesn't bite you so much. And you actually, as a minister, can say, oh dear, that project didn't work, we need to close it down and put the money into something else. Whereas if you pretend everything works, and the public knows it doesn't, you're actually much more vulnerable. Now this relates to the other point I wanted to make, which was about innovation in government. We've been working with um, Mike Bloomberg's team, looking at innovation teams in national, regional, and city governments around the world. And there are many striking features, and one of which is that they embody that spirit I just described, as did Mike Bloomberg, who was quite happy for people to take risks and sometimes fail, and realise if you were honest about that, you were in some way protected against the media and your political opponents. But what's most striking about these I teams is nearly all of them are trying to be people powered in some sense. Uh, one of the best examples is in Korea, where the mayor is social innovation mayor and has mobilised thousands and thousands of citizens to co-design solutions, to help design transport routes using open data, collaborative consumption platforms, you name it. And he's put a big ear outside the city hall, and it's slightly ridiculous in a way. Any citizen can go up and speak into that ear, and your message then appears in city hall and then you get a response back, and he has you know, a million Twitter followers, this man, and communicates largely through social media. <coughs> Very different example from Boston. Some of you may have seen the app for street bumps. Get citizens to download this app, and then when you're driving over a bump in the road, a message is sent to City Hall to know where to fill the hole in. Slightly sort of flippant example in a way, but they're all about a different kind of partnership between citizen and state to solve problems in practical ways. And all of them are using different kinds of crowdsourcing platforms, none of which are quite working yet, but all beginning to become more sophisticated about how you tap into citizen knowledge to solve problems. If you just post a problem and think your problem will be solved by citizens, you'll be very disappointed. But if you put in place a structured stage process, you can get brilliant ideas which really can Make, uh, make a difference. Now, I just want to give two examples of, of what this means in, in, in our own work at my organisation, Nesta. One is on healthcare, and I was in the, the session this afternoon. We've actually been running a programme called People Powered Health in several parts of the National Health Service, 
And for a very simple reason, all over the world, it's now conventional wisdom that the biggest pressures on health budgets are long-term chronic conditions, not acute ones. And it's conventional wisdom that means most healthcare will be done in the home, in the community, not in the hospital or the doctor's surgery. And yet there's been remarkably little systematic innovation to redesign health services to follow through that logic. So we've been working with charities and doctors and so on to think through what would health look like if it really was people-powered. If you really did empower patients to manage their own condition, to support each other, if you really did sometimes get the doctors to prescribe not a pill, but going to join a dance class, evidence appearing to show that joining a dance class is better for your health than most pills. And there was a wonderful thing actually in one of the newspapers here last week on why joining a choir was even better than the dance class in making you live long. And yet who's got an incentive to prescribe going to join a choir? Not many people. So there's lots coming out of that, and if you're interested, we've been trying to work through every detail from workforce skills to tariffs to, um, to regulation of people-powered health. The other project we're doing is a joint team in the Cabinet Office here in the UK called the Centre for Social Action, which is trying to look at every public service and to see where new ways of mobilising public time and energy contribute to better outcomes in schools, in hospitals, in prisons, and so on. And we're backing, we're finding a lot of really good projects which we're trying to grow, sometimes scale, not always to scale them, which symbolise not the idea that the public can replace public services or replace the professionals, but rather that in nearly all of these services, the best solutions are combinations of paid, very trained, very skilled professionals, plus members of the public giving their time and energy to help a prisoner be ready for a job in the outside world or to be a reading mentor or a hospital visitor and so on. Very obvious in many ways, but very lacking from the way most policy uh, is thought about. One of the most interesting examples of that, which we, we just backed a couple of weeks ago, is mobilising the public to be foster carers of isolated older people. So instead of putting them into big residential homes, where you usually die quite quickly, putting them into families, which can give them a room, look after them, and be paid for that service. So it really is people-powered elder care, as opposed to residential care. One of the things which comes out of all of these is an issue which came up in two of the conversations here, complaints. How do you deal with complaints? How do you feel when someone complains? What it turns out is that actually complaints are usually quite a good sign. You usually only complain where you think someone might listen to you. And if you think the state is really a monolithic, oppressive bastard, you don't bother complaining. And so we're trying to work with public services about how to turn complaints from a legalistic, defensive mode to seeing them as a useful source of feedback and guidance on how services can be improved. Fix My Street here was one early example nearly 10 years ago, a platform where you could register broken pavement or lamps or so on. Uh, and Patient Opinion is another one in the health service which has done really well in creating a conversation between the users and the doctors and getting the lawyers out of the way as a crucial element. I just want to make two comments about other lenses which I think come from thinking in a relational way about government and policy. Two very different examples, but both from health again. The first is obesity. As many of you will know, recent research has shown that obesity seems to spread in networks. It's a bit like smoking and all sorts of other behaviours. You're influenced by the people you spend time with. And it therefore follows that often the, perhaps the most effective strategies to reduce obesity find the people who are key nodes in networks and influencing them rather than across the board public health campaigns or incentives or fat taxes and so on. We don't really know yet, but it's a different way of thinking about change. The other example is about the adoption of evidence and the adoption of innovations. Next month we are publishing what I think is a first in the world, but if someone's done one, show me, where we've been using big data sets to track how local doctors implement proven new knowledge about medicine. 
And the great thing about having a very centralized health system here is we have the data sets in primary care and secondary care, and we can actually track down to the individual doctor's level how quickly do they adopt the proven recommendations of our top body NICE. Now, again, guess what the pattern is which comes out from that? What would you guess is the pattern of people acting on evidence? This is in health, where evidence is really clear, lots of medical journals, lots of data. What do you think it says? Okay, it's very late in the evening, I can see you're tired. Um, it, yeah. Exactly. It spreads from one doctor telling their friends. So it's not about the internet, it's not about guidance, it's not about policy. One doctor, one town starts doing something differently and they tell their friends and it spreads in a little network. Quite an important finding with huge implications for actually how you organise both evidence and innovation in public services. I could go on. I'm just going to try and draw... Um, uh, so I could go on for hours. Um, and I won't talk about the common patterns of organisations like the National Security Agency failing to think relationally and therefore running into big problems. But there's a whole story to be told uh, there. I just want to finish by thinking about democracy. Um, the, the, the Gettysburg Address is about democracy. Government of, for, by the people. And the reason I, I earlier quoted lying bastards Bertolt Brecht, is in a way I think we've moved into an era where the model of voting every four or five years for a government clearly doesn't work in relational terms all over the world, not just in the rich north but also in Brazil or India or so on. People are looking for a different kind of interaction uh, with the state, more of a relationship than just you send messages up and the government then does things back to you, and you're meant to be grateful for if there's a correlation between what you ask for and what you get. That model doesn't seem to work anymore. We're seeing, I think, around the world, not what was expected 20 or 30 years ago, which was a move to perpetual referendum or push-button democracy, which have been tried a bit, but usually disastrously. But we're seeing lots, much more interesting experimentation around democracy than I can ever remember. And here are a few examples. So many places are making partial moves from representative to direct. Uh, Iceland's constitution was the most striking example recently, which tried to combine a representative committee plus online engagement plus face-to-face -face engagement for the public to rewrite a constitution. They succeeded in rewriting the constitution. They even succeeded in passing a referendum from the public, and then the parliament blocked it. The old democracy blocked the new democracy, and we're now at an interesting moment there. Uh, lots of experiments with online platforms. They started off with simple petition devices, like where I used to work, 10 Downing Street put a petition site up about 10 years ago. The Pirate Party in Europe has liquid democracy, which is probably the most developed, but probably not in quite the right party to be uh, using it. Uh, and and lots, of, lots of attempts to find ways for people to influence policy platforms in real time. The best of these at the moment, I think, is in Finland. I don't know how many Finns are in the room. But the Open Ministry in Finland is linked into the Parliament and enable citizens to propose legislation, to comment, to improve on it, and then to see it all the way through uh, to implementation, again as a partnership between the formally elected representatives and the public taking part as collaborators. And of course there are many other examples, participatory budgeting projects all over the world now, um, uh, and with some reasonably serious sums of money. This is a field very much in flux, there's an interaction between these sort of top-down projects coming out of governments, out of parliaments, and the more bottom-up ones. We had Jeremy Hyman's here earlier, talking about Avaz. Uh, there's organisations like change.org. Uh, and, and it's still not clear how the bottom-up and the top-down will intersect. They're even more interesting in a country like China, where the Communist Party, and there are quite a few Chinese people in the room, I know, but the ways in which the party monitors Weibo is in part a very detailed tool of social control. 
But I think there's a grain of truth in the claims made by the party there that the detailed monitoring of social media activity allows them to respond to problems and issues at the local or provincial level much faster than the cumbersome old democratic models of the US Congress or a British Parliament. A self-serving argument in some ways, but in other respects, a government employing thousands of people to monitor the real-time complaints and issues and experiences of their people. Worth taking uh, note of. Now, lots, lots of, of lessons to be learned from these new forms of democracy, and given the time, I won't go into those. One of the fascinating projects my organisation is going to be doing next year is working with our partners in Iceland, Finland and Spain to design, and with the World Wide Web Consortium and Tim Berners-Lee, to design next generation democratic platforms to try and work through what combinations of online, offline actually work in reinvigorating democracy. And it's clear that people, power and politics actually has rather different logics at the different stages of democracy. Framing issues, generating or identifying issues, generating options, scrutinizing options, turning them into policy, implementing policy scrutiny. These all turn out to require rather different methods. But I think, and maybe I'm wildly over-optimistic, that we are in a period now where we have the potential to really redesign much of the, really the DNA of how political politics works in democracies, and perhaps to avoid some of the mistakes of the past. What all of this means, I think, going back to where I started, is a different way of thinking about expectations. If governments and politicians pretend to be gods, pretend to be omniscient, pretend to be omnipotent, and pretend that their citizens are children, then disillusion will set in as sure as night follows day. Equally, if they go to the other extreme and spend their time in perpetual consultation, never making decisions, uh, people will be pretty unhappy as well. But I think we're seeing the beginnings of some ways of solving these problems through, um, through transforming relationships. And because this is a, a, a university, uh, I'm going to end with a quote from a philosopher. You're very clever people. Ludwig Wittgenstein. He said that in life, we first learn belief, and then we learn doubt. At school, we learn belief. We're told all the things we should believe in. Then we come to university, and we're told it was all a pack of lies. And we learn some critical faculties through that. Now, because he was a philosopher, he stopped there. But I think what comes after belief and doubt is something else. It is action, but hopefully action informed by wisdom and judgment, the ability to understand the ambiguities of the world. And in my optimistic moments, I think and hope we are seeing the beginnings of a shift to a mode of government which really embodies that and embodies these things. Government which is open, its default, is for its data, its information to be transparent, which the default of government is to be experimental, to try things out before turning them into policy, to be evidence and data-based, to be open to finding out what works and doesn't, and perhaps above all, to be good at doing things with people, not just to them and for them. A set of skills and mindsets which are different from the ones of perhaps 10 or 20 years when the NPM was dominant and all you had to be good at was I don't know, designing a quasi-market, or the models 50 years ago where all you had to be good at was sort of implementing in a technocratic way a new economic plan on the public. These are new skills and new approaches, but I think they're in reality the only way of getting out of the expectations trap. Thank you. Thank you hugely, Jeff. We've got some time for a couple of questions. So um, I'll take, we'll start here with Sheila and Cornel. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent, excellent talk. And thank you for being so optimistic. Now, can I sort of 
ask you to have your optimistic thought process hat on and say, how can you make this um, government in, in relational terms and the expectation and expectation gaps work where it's really broken down? I'm thinking of sort of the Arab Spring democracies where, you know, uh, there seems to be, I mean, there was a wonderful um, uh, magazine cover by Time, the world's best demonstrators, the world's worst Democrats on, on the last Tahrir Square incidents in, in Egypt, in, in Libya, where it's even more broken down. How can you use these terms and how can you use the people in power to help sort of heal the wounds and create that relational government? Terrific. So. What do you do when people divorce their government? <laughs> um, Sheila. Uh, Sheila. I'll take a little class. Yep, okay. I, um, yes, I too enjoyed your, your uh, statements. Now, I, I, but I also feel a little, shall I say, frightened if dissolutioned as an African. Mm -hmm. One, because you, you didn't reference Africa. Uh, and, you, and I appreciate that because probably that your, your organization works in these countries and you can only really uh, use examples where you work. But nevertheless, I'm going to ask you a question and, and demand that you speak on Africa. <laughs> and, and here is the reason, because in effect, we are part of the global world. If we have working democracies in the West uh, and a complete failure in another part of the world. It seems to me that the West will be under risk, and, and there are many examples of why we can't reinvent one part of the world. And, and so I'm imploring you to apply your mind to, while you are thinking of uh, Finland, if you wish, as the next generation democracy, and when you think of the gap between where Finland is today and where Africa is, how in God's name do we bridge that new democracy by not risking that uh, Finland goes charging at galloping speed while the rest of the world is watching in turmoil, albeit through Tahrir Square. What are your thoughts on Good. bridging that gap? So why, why Finland, not Botswana or Ghana? <laughs> yeah. um, over this side, mm -hmm. up to there. Can you wave your hand in the air? Good, thank you. I'm, I'm going to characterize you slightly as someone who's a fan of um, both evidence and innovation. Um, but recently, some high profile figures have said that the two can't necessarily coexist. So if you're always going to follow what works, then how will you ever get breakthrough innovation? Could you just talk a little bit about that? Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Great, and last question, Raul. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could comment uh, on not just technology to bypass local tyranny, as you mentioned with the UID program, but also technology uh, to renew existing institutions and to strengthen them. So for example, one of the, the cousins of the UID program in India is the Public Information Infrastructure Program. Mm. Uh, 250,000 grassroots elected organizations being linked up with broadband and with wireless technology. Um, and these are elected bodies, they allow communities to control their government, now you're informing these communities so that they can be more demanding of government. So are there, is, is there a diversity of approach that's possible uh, when you talk about technology? Is it necessarily replace the past or can it be bring the past forward uh, you know, and, and, and help develop it? Okay, well take, taking those one by one. First of all, on the, the Arab Spring, and, uh, and Egypt and so on. <clears throat> just, I'll just make one point about it, which is maybe an obvious point, but it's, it really applies to any kind of a collective intelligence tool. As you said, Twitter, Facebook and so on, quite good for getting people onto the streets, absolutely hopeless for running anything. And that's been a universal experience. It's not just limited to Egypt. If you run an NGO or a business or a government, you'll be very unwise to crowdsource your decisions. And it's striking nearly all the really important decisions in all of your organizations will be made by, made by small groups of people sitting around a table with hopefully some deep trust between them, but informed increasingly by the digital aura of the social media. Uh, and in Egypt, which I know moderately well, but not very well, I mean, it's, it's kind of blindingly obvious that there was a, well, you know, issues about where the movements came from, but mainly it's the, the, the lack of 
the long, important task of nurturing a cadre of people with the skills, ethos, capacities to govern and lead in a different way. And social media on their own are never going to solve uh, that problem. That's probably why you know, the Blavatnik School exists to help with that. But it's, it's a bit the same in all many, many other fields. There's a little bit of fetish and myth about the role of technology and the sort of things it can do. There are no collective intelligence tools yet. There are interesting tools which support collective intelligence, but it still ultimately depends on people interacting with each other. Blah, blah, blah. Secondly, in, in relation to, to Africa, I, I don't know Africa well. I, I did give examples from Asia and Latin America where we do work, my organization works, but we don't uh, in Africa. So, mea culpa, I don't really like talking about things I don't know anything about. What I would say is that the places of the world I do know show me how remarkably democracy can spread. Next to Finland is Estonia, which has only been a democracy for 20 years, and now comes top on various rankings, including technology in government in the world. Um, I was last month in Colombia, you know, a remarkable transformation in one generation from where it was. And it wasn't that long ago people thought the norms and methods of democracy couldn't spread to particular parts of the world. There were cultural and other reasons why they could never take root elsewhere. Again and again, we found that not to be the case. So change can happen very, very fast in many fronts, but I would always advise people not to speak of that which they don't understand. <laughs> That's why I didn't talk about Africa. Innovation and evidence, what you said is exactly right. I, I see innovation and evidence as having almost opposite mentalities. Innovation at its best is exploratory, creative, risk-taking, widen your horizons, be fearless. The people who are good at evidence are, in some ways, small-minded, narrow, obsessive, skeptical, you know, and these are complementary cultures. And I think you need both. In any system, you need Plenty of people who, whose job it is to be creative, exploratory, and so on, and other people whose job it is to be the skeptics. And the, the tragedy is most areas of public policy have neither enough people whose job it is to be creative, nor enough people whose job it is to be skeptical and rigorous. Instead, you have some people who are a little bit in between, and therefore we get not very good public policy and, um, and public services. And there was one final, oh yeah. The, the panchayats and, and UID and so on, I, I mean, I think you, you, you're in a sense saying the answer to your own question, that I think there is an interesting task to be done perhaps in every country to imagine what does it mean to be the most local unit of government now in the modern world. Um, we're doing a, quite an interesting project here in the UK around hyperlocal media. How can you create Again, this is maybe too technology-oriented, but the web-based platform at the very local level, which provides news, provides a platform for people to exchange things with each other, provides the way to do consultations and surveys on you know, a new planning proposal, etc. And I've got a hunch that some of these most media tools will turn out to be part of the answer to your question. And we need almost the formal representative bodies of democracy to reach out and find new partnerships with these often web-based things coming out of the community or sometimes out of old media um, to really almost reinvent a new kind of governance. But I've really no idea what the true answer will be, and it may well be different in different countries. But again, that's why you know, we are very lucky to be living now. This is a time of extraordinary experiment where so much of what we took for granted about governance, which was mainly designed in the late 19th century, is really being redesigned in front of our eyes. That's interesting. And what a great note to end on. So before I hand back to Callum, who will tell us what to do <laughs> next, <laughs> um, can you join me in thanking Jeff for a wonderful